2020 has been a historically terrible year. It seems like horrible event after horrible event has gut-punched everyone without time to recover from the last. Admittedly, it has not been a great year for the film industry with both production of films and theaters being shut down due to the pandemic, but that didn't stop a few gems from emerging this year, thanks mostly to streaming services. Keep in mind, this list is my opinion, and I did not have the opportunity to see many films that I wanted to see like Minari or Nomadland. So without further ado, here's my top 10 movies of 2020. Number 10, Dick Johnson is Dead, directed by Kirsten Johnston. I'm not much of a documentary guy, they often struggle to keep me emotionally invested or they manipulate the truth to be more dramatic than it actually is. Dick Johnson is Dead simultaneously tugs at the heartstrings and wears its manipulation of the truth on its sleeve. This film follows Dick Johnson, who is an elderly man with dementia, and the father of filmmaker Kirsten Johnson. Kirsten knows her father was reaching the end of his life, and to soften the blow of this hard truth, she gives fictional accounts of possible scenarios in which her father could die. She also shows the true story of his life, and shows the people who he's affected positively. This film came out at a great time for me because a little over a year ago, my grandpa passed away. I knew it would happen one day, but nothing could prepare me to see the finality of death happen to someone that I loved. My grandpa was similar in many ways to Dick Johnson, and he too went through a phase where we knew death was approaching. I'm so glad a film could perfectly convey the hardship of this period in time. I do not see this type of story explored very often, and I'm glad this film also took a comedic approach to it. We laugh so we don't cry. It also helps that Dick Johnson is such a likable, positive man that I ended up caring about a lot. I highly suggest this to anyone with parents or grandparents reaching this period in their life, as watching this film is cathartic and celebratory. I give Dick Johnson is Dead an 8 out of 10. It's on Netflix, so check it out. Number 9, Mangrove, directed by Steve McQueen. Let me start this by saying that I recommend all the films in Steve McQueen's anthology series, Small Acts, but my personal favorite is Mangrove. The series follows the lives of West Indian immigrants in London during the 60s and 70s. Something I really love about every one of these films is the atmosphere. They're all great slice of life dramas that makes you forget you're watching actors. Everything from the jargon, to the cooking, to the music, to the culture overall is just so authentic. Mangrove does not have the best atmosphere of these films, but it is the most emotional to me. It gives the viewer a strong sense of righteous anger. It is also very relevant to issues with race and the police that are still going on today. It is a great historical drama and a great court drama, and my only issues with it are that they are confined to those genres. It executes everything well but does not push beyond the genre, mainly to stay accurate to the events that took place. The direction by Steve McQueen gives it the edge to go from good to great. The environment in this film reminds me of the environment in Do the Right Thing because of how vital it is to the story, and both films also cover similar themes. This is the type of film that could win Best Picture, and I wouldn't even be mad about it. I give Mangrove an 8 out of 10, and it, along with the entire Small Act series, is on Amazon Prime Video. Number 8, First Cow, directed by Kelly Reichardt. This is a niche film if I've ever seen one. I get the feeling that most everyone who watches this will either love it or hate it. It's very similar to Old Joy, which was also directed by Kelly Reichardt, in that it is a slow-paced meditation on friendship. It is incredibly simplistic, there's a lot of b-roll footage, and as said before, it is slow. So if any of those things turn you off, I suggest not watching it. But if you don't mind that, and you want a sweet story that is personal and intimate, definitely watch it. The 4x3 aspect ratio makes it feel more intimate and small scale, and the cinematography isn't necessarily striking, but it conveys the tone very well. 
I love how small the story is because we can see the friendship of the main characters in the center stage. The friendship does not take a backseat to what happens, it is the whole point of the film, and it is really beautiful and realistic. I give this film an 8 out of 10, and it is available on Hulu if you have a premium subscription. Hear me. You will not kill Paul. Number 7, The Five Bloods, directed by Spike Lee. This film is not by any means subtle, but it is effective. This film is an homage to Apocalypse Now and shows the wounds caused by Vietnam that still cut deep today, especially for black men who were fighting for the rights that they did not have. Spike Lee's directing is great, the cinematography is crisp in the present day sequences, and the cinematography in the flashbacks looks authentically vintage. The music was good, it even seemed Steven Spielberg-esque and heightened the sense of adventure. Delroy Lendo went all out with his performance, and even though I thought his character became a little too unlikable, like he was a cartoon villain, his was in the top 5 performances of the year for me. As for the negatives of the film and the flashback scenes, all the older characters had nothing done to them to make them look younger, and it was a little distracting, and there were also some weird editing choices, even though they seemed intentional. I do like how Spike Lee portrays different angles of racial tension in all of his films, and this film, among many, impresses me with Netflix's originals. I give this film an 8 out of 10. Watch it on Netflix. What are you wearing? It's an homage to you, Your Honor. Do you have clothes underneath there? Yes. Hold on. Yes. Take off the robes, please. Coming in at number six is The Trial of the Chicago Seven, directed by Aaron Sorkin. I was surprised to put yet another historical court drama on this list. Usually you know exactly what to expect from a courtroom drama. And while this film does fit several of the stereotypes of the genre, it's Aaron Sorkin's lively writing that makes this worth watching. The direction was not bad, but there are multiple scenes where you can tell Sorkin is a writer first and a director second. The only other negatives I can think of were that it is too constrained by being a court drama like Mangrove, and I was not a huge fan of Eddie Redmayne's acting, he's just too one-dimensional with no nuance and he was really unlikable even when his character was supposed to be sympathetic. Other than that, it was funny, witty, informative, and slightly emotional. I was really impressed with Sasha Baron Cohen. This was the first serious role I saw him in. I love when actors go out of their element and challenge themselves and it actually pays off. If this film has taught me one thing, it's that I wish Aaron Sorkin was my history teacher, because he is the best writer when it comes to taking real life events and making them actually entertaining to watch. Hopefully this gets a best screenplay nomination from the Oscars, and I'm going to give this an 8 out of 10. It's another Netflix original, so check it out there. Remind me never again to work with a washed up alcoholic. Duly noted. Nelson Algren, please copy. All right. No doubt you'll get your credit, but ask yourself, who's producing this picture, directing it, starring in it? Number 5 is Mank, directed by David Fincher. Alright, last historical drama, I promise. While this is not one of my favorite David Fincher films, it is still pretty great. I was surprised that it was written by his father, who had never written a screenplay before and has not written one since this was conceived in the late 90s. I've heard this film being compared to Citizen Kane, the film that it is about the making of, and there were homages and similarities, but I would not put it on that much of a pedestal. But don't get me wrong though, I loved it. It was exactly what it needed to be, a good movie. Gary Oldman and Amanda Seyfried both shined in their roles, and the technical aspects were all perfect. I also enjoyed the cynical look at Hollywood that we don't often see from Hollywood produced movies. I don't have much else to say about this besides the fact that it accomplishes everything it sets out to do. I'm giving this an 8 out of 10. It's another Netflix original, so you can watch it there. Number 6 
Number 4, Another Round, directed by Thomas Vinterberg. This film tackles a wide range of emotions and it never outstretches its reach. The concept was interesting enough, but what really sold it was Mads Mikkelsen, who blew me away. There was not a second in this film where I did not believe his character. He showcased anger, frustration, depression, lightheartedness, passion, and excitement all perfectly. Even though the film was in Danish, I could tell by the expressions and inflections that every actor brought their A-game. Something about midlife crisis films just appealed to me even though I've not reached that point in my life because it shows a very relatable drudge of muted emotions and going through the motions that I've found myself in. When it got to the third act, it started to feel a little by the numbers because it seemed the writers didn't know how to wrap it up, but the very ending was great, it being my favorite movie ending of the year. I give another round an 8 out of 10. Unfortunately, you cannot stream this, but you can buy it or rent it online. Pepe the Frog is an omen. We need to listen because it's not going to go away until we hear the message that it has to say. Number 3, Feels Good Man, directed by Arthur Jones. 2020 was a year of surprises, and that includes films. And I cannot believe this documentary exists. It is a documentary about none other than Pepe the Frog. I was not prepared for a roller coaster of twists and turns that this entails. It included the origins of the character, how it became popular, how it was added to the national hate symbol list, how it related to the 2016 election how Alex Jones was sued by the creator, and just how much of a cultural icon it became. I did not know there was this much depth to a cartoon frog. I'm so glad this exists because there are no good meme movies that are accurate to meme culture and are also entertaining. Matt Fury, the creator of Pepe, was like a likable Toby Flenderson mixed with a regular show character, and he was just really charming and I loved watching him. I really felt for the struggle he had to go through with this character being abused, and it provided good drama to this documentary. It's such a breath of fresh air to have such an entertaining, true story that isn't manipulated. I give Feels Good Man a 9 out of 10. You can buy or rent it online. Coming in at number 2 is Sound of Metal, directed by Darius Martyr. I was prepared for a whiplash copycat with this, but boy was I pleasantly surprised. This has one of my favorite uses of sound in a film ever. The sound design places us directly in Ruben's shoes as a drummer that loses his hearing, and many moments are made more poignant and resonant because of the sound. I love the characterization, as there's a lot of subtlety that makes every character just so rich. I'm a sucker for great anger scenes, and this has a great one. Riz Ahmed deserves an Oscar for this role. This was my favorite lead performance of the year. This makes me want to visit some more of Darius Martyr's work, because what I saw this film was so unique and heavy hitting. I give Sound of Metal a 9 out of 10. You can stream this on Amazon Prime Video. Before I give my favorite movie of the year, I want to give some honorable mentions. Borat's subsequent movie film is definitely a lesser film than the original, but there's just enough material to justify its existence. I don't know how well this film will age because it's so specific to the events of 2020, but for the time, it's pretty good. I love all the scenes where it is messing with real life people, but I think the scripted segments are weaker in comparison. There was also a lot of, hey, remember this from the first movie moments, but the film wasn't really bogged down by this. It made me laugh, which is what it set out to do. I give this a 7 out of 10. Watch it on Amazon Prime Video. Tenet is polarizing, and I'm still not entirely sure how I feel about it. On one hand, a majority of the movie is just exposition to explain the convoluted plot, and the characters don't have that much depth, but on the other hand, it was fun. Like Borat 2, I recognize the flaws in it, but I finished the film being entertained. It is the most Christopher Nolan-y movie he has ever made, so I feel like whatever you think of Nolan will determine how much you like this movie.
I give Tenant a 7 out of 10 and it is available for purchase or to rent. The Devil All the Time was pretty good. I think it too was exactly what it needed to be for the goals it had. I just don't feel like I will ever want to revisit it now that I've seen it. There was definitely some memorable imagery and moments. Tom Holland did great playing against his type, as did Robert Pattinson, who is slowly becoming one of my favorite actors. This is a very dark film, so keep that in mind. I feel like there is too much trauma for us to view in this, however. I love films that are brave enough to explore subject matter that's hard to tackle, but I just felt exhausted by this. Nothing good really happens in this movie to the characters, and I feel like maybe there should have been some high points to make us care about them instead of just seeing terrible things happen to them constantly, but that's just my opinion. I give this a 7 out of 10, and you can watch it on Netflix. I recommend all of the small axe films which I briefly covered when I talked about Mangrove. I will rank them from my least to most favorite now. Red, White, and Blue was good, John Boyega did great, and it was good subject matter. It just felt lacking compared to the other small axe films. It's a 7 out of 10 for me. Education did a good job at opening my eyes to a serious issue, and it made me empathize with the main character, but it being so short, it still felt padded out. I give it a 7 out of 10. Alex Weedle was another interesting story. I like the use of music and the acting. 7 out of 10. Lover's Rock is very simplistic, but I absolutely loved it. This one has the best atmosphere and tone out of all the small axe films. It felt very warm and inviting, and it was a great exploration of culture. 8 out of 10. All of these, as said before, are on Amazon Prime Video. My last honorable mention is Pixar's Soul. It was a very mature film for Pixar, and I respect what they're trying to do. It covers philosophical questions that actually had me thinking. The animation was pristine and beautiful, as usual for Pixar. They sure know how to make use of film as a visual medium. I give this an 8 out of 10. It's on Disney+. Plus. We used to play the genius edition of the. Uh, we used to play the genius edition genius. of. We used to play the genius edition genius. of Trivial Pursuit. What? It's genius edition. Oh, I always thought the word was genius. I and my favorite movie of 2020 is I'm Thinking of Ending Things, directed by Charlie Kaufman. I know this pick will upset some people, but I don't care. This film is extremely polarizing. Half the people who saw it will call it a masterpiece, and the other half thinks it's complete pretentious nonsense. I think because I was familiar with Charlie Kaufman's other work, I knew what to expect. I really don't know why I don't find Kaufman pretentious, because everything he does seems like it would fit that category, but it's just so brutally honest and artistic. I'm not going to reveal what the film means, but I will say, if you've only seen it once, you really haven't seen it. If you know what it means, then the film is seen through a whole new lens. It's sort of like piecing together a puzzle, and once it's completed, I found the whole picture very satisfying. Kaufman can express internal conflict like no other screenwriter, and though it is similar to Synecdoche, New York, it is also very different. The film has its own feel. On a rewatch, I realized that I had remembered almost everything that happened in the film months after I would seen it the first time. It just stuck with me and made me think about it for long after I would seen it. This is very hard subject matter. It covers a painful fear of mine that I often suppress. Kaufman makes me think about things I don't want to think about, and I'm better for it. He shows the ugliest parts of himself, as well as everyone else, to help us deal with the stomach-churning pain of being human. Tony Collette and David Thewlis stole the show for me. As they age, they give incredible performances that are the best performances of old people by non-old people I think I've ever seen. I barely scratched the surface on this film, so I suggest watching YMS's video explaining the film which I will link in the description. I'm giving I'm Thinking of Ending Things a 9 out of 10, and it is available on Netflix.